Welcome to the YouTube channel on poverty and culture. Our channel is dedicated to understanding how culture affects poverty and other social problems. Through discussions with our guests, we hope to understand that connection more deeply and thus find better answers. Our host is Larry Mead, a longtime scholar of poverty and welfare reform and the author of the recent Burdens of Freedom. Our initial ideas about culture come from this book, but the discussion may take us in new directions. Howard Husak is a longtime expert on anti-poverty policy. After heading policy research at the Manhattan Youth Institute, he's now a senior fellow at the Philanthropy Roundtable and an adjunct fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, okay, welcome to our audience. Uh, I'm Larry Mead, a professor at NYU. Uh, we appreciate your interest in poverty and culture, a very important question. Uh, by culture, we mean roughly uh, what people think life's about, uh, what are we supposed to be doing and being? Uh, what are we aiming to do? Um, also, uh, the great fact that we begin with is that America is divided culturally. We have a dominant culture that comes from Europe, which is uh, interdriven and individualist. Uh, and then we have a number of other groups in the country who came from somewhere else, who came from various parts of the world, but they're not coming from Europe and, they're, and their way of life is quite different. Now, what are the chief differences? Well, in, as I've already mentioned, the dominant culture is an individualist one where people are primarily seek to act out goals which they themselves have chosen uh, and, and, which and which focus their life and, and their efforts. Um, on the other hand, uh, people from the non-West tend to be more cautious. They tend to adjust to the environment rather than seeking change. Uh, and an another important difference is that for uh, people from the individualist background, the notions of right and wrong, the moral structure, tends to be based upon generalizations, principles which they internalize at a young age and which give them a sense of what to do and not do uh, afterwards. Uh, whereas for minority groups and people from the non-Western world, uh, the moral structure is much more based upon uh, uh, pressure and input from outside, from the society, from government, from tradition. So the moral structure is based much more on external uh, direction. Now, two important facts to notice at the outset. First of all, there is no idea here that one culture is better than another. On the contrary, they have uh, different strengths and weaknesses. They're good at some things, not good at other things. So we're not assessing best and worst here at all. And the second thing is that neither of these cultures is clearly tied to race. Uh, the sources that I use, which come from research on world cultures, say very clearly that culture has no definite connection to race, that uh, people of any race may assume any culture depending upon how they're socialized. So that's a brief summary, and I want to get Howard's reaction. Well, thank you very much, Larry, and thank you for having me. Uh, you know, as you know, I, I've admired a lot of your work over the years. I admired uh, your work in uh, social policy and how it affected our public assistance regulations. I thought it was very constructive and encouraging people to participate in the workforce. And uh, I've admired a lot of your writing. I, I don't agree with much of the, uh, many of the ideas in Burdens of Freedom. And I hope you'll forgive me for, uh, for that. Uh, let, let me start in the following way. In the book, you, you discuss why uh, different cultures have developed economically and socially in different ways, and some have become more economically successful, and you ascribe that to this individualism uh, versus a more collectivist uh, um, culture. Uh, I, I, I'm no expert uh, on how countries develop and why. There's a deep literature on this. Uh, David Landis, even Walt Rostow. This goes back for a long ways. Uh, I once heard Jeffrey Sachs give a, a long and very convincing lecture that everything about development was related to distance from the equator yes. and that those in temperate climates just had to struggle more and adjust and therefore became more innovative and entrepreneurial and individualistic to survive. I'm agnostic about those things. I don't think you properly acknowledge that literature and its and its diversity in the book, but that's not my main quarrel. Uh, I, I I don't really accept the idea that minority groups in the United States 
uh, exhibit uh, aspects of a different psychology that you call collectivist. I, I, I just, I don't accept that and I don't, uh, differences in economic success and other uh, metrics won't, won't convince me that they're in some different place psychologically. And let me, let me just, let me just start with uh, African Americans. Uh, I, I happen to, for my whole professional career, my personal life, you know, I, 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 I think worried as so many Americans do about the progress of African Americans and uh, their relative status. But to attribute the extent to which uh, African Americans still lag, and it's not all of them lag, as you point out in the book, in terms of your reference to the middle class uh, minority community, to attribute that to some collectivist uh, psychology that came from Africa 400 years ago strikes me as borderline absurd when one considers the intervening circumstances that affected American black people. Obviously, slavery would have strangled to some extent whatever culture was brought over. But we'll just put that aside. You know, we had following the Civil War and the end of slavery, a hundred years plus of what can only be called serfdom, in, in which black people were tied to the land through a system that required them to pay the owners of the land and made it very difficult for them to accumulate wealth that uh, consigned them not only to second class schools, but in some cases to no education. But I, I'm, say, I'm saying that too. I'm agreeing with you about that. But I'm, I'm saying that that explains, I, I, I don't see how this collectivist culture that they supposedly brought over from Africa can be more explanatory or even relevant to their situation today. And, and I think that is, is that the research that I cite says that Africa is the least individual's culture in the world. Uh, collectivism doesn't mean that it's in favor of big government, rather that people don't have much sense of themselves as separate from a group. So well, I, I disagree with that too. You know, uh, I think I think we see tremendous aspiration among. I mean, I mean, take the most obvious cultural examples in entertainment and sports. People are aspiring as individuals, yes, and succeeding as individuals. But I think it goes much, much beyond that. Yeah, but and the, I think I think that you have completely expunged from this history the deleterious interventions of progressivism and liberalism that have specifically affected and stunted African-American culture. Uh, so in my own upcoming book, The Poor Side of Town and Why We Need It, I talk about urban renewal and public housing. Urban renewal wiped out large African-American communities in which there were significant rates of owner occupancy of residents and significant owner ownership of small businesses in the name of helping them. This was a terrible thing. And so to me, and I always thought you would have agreed with this, but it surprises me. Liberal interventions have harmed black people disproportionately, I believe, and okay. not some hangover from Africa. Well, but that, that's really not what I say. I don't say that there's still Africans in the 20th century. I'm saying that coming as Africans and then going through slavery and Jim Crow, their experience is one of passive reaction to a hostile environment. And it, that lasts until they go into the north. When they leave the south and come north, then they have to... So passive reaction. Was the Underground Railroad a passive reaction? Not for those organizing it. There's a leadership that is definitely, definitely assertive. It's, it's complicated because throughout this entire process, part of Black America is becoming individualist. The long-term wow. story of Black America is towards individualism. I agree with that. It, so that can happen. We can have people who come here and are assimilated into individualism. Yes, and that's what, exactly. And that's what's happened among the black leadership. See, the people who overthrew Jim Crow were primarily blacks that had gone to school and gone to church in the 19th century. And they took on what I call the burdens of freedom. They became individualists. 
and they're much more formidable than the people before that who were who were who simply associated themselves with the demands made on them. Now, the new the, the leadership. I mean, they, you make it sound like that was the choice. They associated themselves. I mean, they were caught. Yes, they were following orders for all that time. But the leadership said, "Stuff this! I'm going to live my own life," and they did. And those are the people that became the leaders of the group. And but they're they're only a minority of the group. The the, the bulk of Black America doesn't really begin to adjust to an individualist culture until they come north from the south. And, and that, they make decisions. They are living in the Mississippi Delta, and they decide, shrug, shrugging off this residue of collectivism and order following, that they are going to go north to Chicago. That's yeah. immigration. Yeah, but that's okay. That's similar to immigration. That's why, in a way, blacks are parallel immigrants, because the immigrants today, not at, in the progressive era, but today's immigrants are coming also from a non-individualist background. And so adjustment is harder. For blacks coming from the South, they also are adjusting to individualism. And that's very hard. And well, the, Let's talk about previous ways of immigration, which you, yeah. as many of, uh, of whose members you ascribe to this more individualistic way of life. You know, uh, were Southern Italians devout individualists? Not, not as fully as Northern Europeans, but more so than the people we have now who are coming from Asia, Latin America. Uh, th these are societies that are not at all individualist. And, and yet we see an Asian American who heads uh, Google. We see Asian Americans owning hotels throughout the American South because they're entrepreneurs? Well, they, they, they sure seem individualistic to me. Oh, no, that isn't the typical Asian experience. Oh, it's not typical. No. The, the typical Asian experience, and very much consistent with Asia, is to do very, very well as long as they're going through school. And after that point, Asians have a significant difficulty deciding what they want to do because that isn't part of Asian culture. In Asian culture, you take orders from above. You let your, the various authorities in your life tell you what to do, and you never really leave home. Whereas in, in America, the individualist culture, we assume children are going to leave home, and they're going to go off and, and live their own lives and be innovative in various ways they decide. That isn't well, the Asian way. Well, notwithstanding that, bracketing that, Japanese Mer Americans are among the highest income households in America. They come from Asia the last time I looked. Correct, but they're not innovative. They don't they're not innovative. They, they, they didn't start businesses all over California that got expropriated. But you don't see creativity that creates a new structure, a new world. I mean, the thing about American culture, the, the culture that came from Europe, is that people are, are, to, are able to imagine a new reality that is, transforms the life of the country. And the, the great fact about America is that we tolerate that. We tolerate people who transform our lives by some innovative genius. And these are the people that created the Silicon Valley. They created all kinds of tech industries that weren't there before. Now, within that structure, agents do very well, but they didn't create it. And in fact, Japan is noted for a very high number of patents, but very few Nobel Prizes. Asia isn't able to do the things that the really creative scientists do because their way of thinking is deference to authority. In fact, the entire non-Western world is characterized by deference to authority. So isn't that a way of saying that there's a self-selection, since you talked about the development of individualism among people uh, who, who come to America or, or have been exposed to it in the case of the, the black leadership in the South, isn't that a way of saying that those who come to America self-select and are, are drawn to individualism and thrive here because they're in a different environment, that they're not held back by it. I think here of Steve Jobs and his father. So I don't know if Syria is one of your less in, or more individualistic countries, but Steve Jobs' father decided to come to America, and Steve Jobs became among the most innovative people in history. That, that's right. But the, the innovators typically come from Europe. The immigrants that have done that, that sort of thing, they're coming from Europe because that's where the culture is individualist and only in Europe. Syria so, is in Europe? The world do not show this. I mean, one of the great facts about the research is that 
what we take to be a universal temperament, the individualism of American society, is not universal. It's, in fact, exceptional. The, the world of America is very strange to most of humanity. And, and the, the selection that used to operate in people coming here because they're seeking a life of freedom, I don't see that now. What happens is, first of all, getting here is a lot easier than it used to be, and people are mostly coming for survival. And that's the dominant impulse of the non-West, is survival, simply to get through the day. And it's Howard, uh, Howard, if I can uh, interject for a minute, I, I, I'm not sure I agree with your assessment that... <clears throat> the uh, legacy of slavery um, is permanently debilitating in some way. I, I didn't say popular. that. I didn't say that. I say they, that black people endured that and that it may have erased collectivism or reinforced collectivism. You know, but well, I, I, you know, if you, I can't think of examples of entire populations who have been uh, affected that kind of way by, uh, by, by external forces and injustices. Let's take example, uh, uh, in Russia, uh, Alexander II uh, published the Emancipation Manifesto in 1861, not by coincidence, uh, 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 influenced by the Enlightenment. And uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the people, including my, uh, my wife from Ukraine, she uh, she suffered. Her family suffered under the Stalin uh, uh, forced starvation, and she is and she and that, that culture have have not been uh, affected the way that you're saying you can be affected under these kinds of circumstances. Well, let me just react to that one point, Jason. Well, I, I, I'm not going to argue about who was more victimized. I think that's. I, 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 I'm not going to compare the history of Ukraine to the history of slavery. My people all come from Ukraine and Belarus, you know, and they managed to thrive in America. So I, I don't know where to go with that. That's my big question, Larry, is if this divide exists in the United States, and even if you're right, I happen to think people self-select, that they exhibit ambition once they get here, that it transcends just survival that they exhibit ambition and that crossing the Rio Grande may be about survival, but it's certainly about ambition and self-selection too, as well as with immigrants from the Caribbean who are, who are, who are black, you know, but where do we go with that? If what you say that I don't particularly agree with, but if what you say is true, where do we go with that? What we do is promote assimilation to the individual's culture. You see, that's what I don't see among his most Hispanics in general are a depressed and defeated culture in America. There are very few. What's the basis for saying they're depressed and defeated? I, again, I'm citing studies by various people, the observations by Hispanic authors themselves, and what they describe is people who struggle with getting their lives together. And that's what I've seen in my own students. Hispanics don't lack for intelligence, desire to get ahead. But what I don't see is the capacity to organize in order to go and get it. See, whereas that's what the reason that this problem occurs is, is actually similar to blacks in Mexico, in Central America, where the where people are coming from, they're dealing with a very intolerable situation in terms of their immediate environment. But the society is conservative and it maintains order in, in a personal and family sense. But when they cross the border into America, in the United States, then families start to collapse because now America isn't like that. America is freer and it assumes that the structure of the order is now internalized, that you do what you know to be right rather than being, rather than because you've been told by somebody. And well, I, I will say this, that child abandonment was, father, by fathers was not uncommon in the Jewish community in the Depression. So, not what we see now. Nothing. Well, you know. But, but have people going through really difficult circumstances, yeah, they, they, they can have a hard time. But, but I will say this. I agree with you about encouraging assimilation. We're not even supposed to use the term assimilation anymore, as you may know. It's now yeah. integration. Uh, and that brings me, though, to, to a, a, a concomitant point, which is this, that <clears throat> maybe less – 
the inherited collectivist psychology, obedience to authority, deference cultures that new immigrants are coming from that is handicapping them if they are handicapped, then the loss of confidence in that individualistic culture that you describe among American elites. American well, elites in the 20th century were encouraging citizenship, yes. English acquisition, ambition, education. And now they're basically on the sidelines. Yeah, I agree with that. In fact, the, your book on who killed civil society is very relevant here. You describe a world in which in the progressive era, institutions like the settlement houses promoted citizenship, promoted qualities that I would associate with an individualist culture. But as time went on, as we went into the 60s, they stopped doing that. And the welfare state became known as simply giving out benefits and not promoting good behavior. Now, why did that change occur? And there's a number of reasons, but I would say one of the major reasons is that the groups that the social institutions and programs had to deal with became much more resistant to assimilating the norms of good behavior. Why? Because they were now coming from blacks and Hispanics who were coming from outside that culture. Whereas in the time of Jane Addams, they were people from Europe, they were immigrants from Europe who had some more idea of, that they were supposed to learn rules of good behavior. And that was part of what... I, I, I just, I, I, I can't accept that idea. I think what changed, and I say this in the book that you kindly referenced, I, I, I think what changed is the attitudes of elites. That's true too. Capitalism was flawed. People yep. needed to be buffered from its effects. As, a per, as opposed to being prepared to participate and succeed. That was, that was also part of it. But as Charles Murray points out in, uh, in uh, Coming Apart, the upper class has actually remained traditional-minded in its own lifestyle. True. And, and, and they have remained individualist in the classic sense of pursuing personal goals, but maintaining an orderly family life and adhering to it a set of norms of that good behavior, which they teach their children, and, and which these children then go on to have usually successful, successful lives. But as Charles points out, they're not willing to preach what they practice. Right. So we become permissive. But in fact, that's what today's immigrants need even more than they needed 100 years ago. Because well, I'll be agnostic on whether they need it more or less, but I agree that it's something that should be fundamental to an immigrant society. Yeah, which we which we've always been. I mean, for instance, I among I get outraged all the time, as you know. I'm outraged right now, right? That's what yeah. I do. But uh, I'm outraged that it costs eight hundred dollars to take the citizenship test. Why are we charging people to take the citizenship yeah. test? Yeah. Well, I would rather pay them to take it. Yeah, but the story you told with your own family in that book is classic an immigrant story. Okay, where a family comes up through finding ways to get ahead and moving up in the world. But that assumes that your life is a project that you seek to advance over time. That's very individualist. That isn't what we typically see in immigrant neighborhoods or in black neighborhoods today. What we see is a focus on survival, of getting ahead and some surviving and getting what one can from this immediate environment. And that's understandable if you're coming from Central America. I, I just think that's so broad brush about, especially about black neighborhoods, you know, in Detroit in 1918, yeah, I, I have a new book coming out, which I have a long chapter on a place called Black Bottom in Detroit, which was not named for any racial reasons. It was, the soil was very black when the French discovered it, but it became the, a, a thriving black community uh, in Detroit, eventually entirely eradicated, torn down to build high-rise public housing projects. Okay. It's just These kinds of outrages just make me feel but, but, that liberalism has suffocated uh, black individuals. But what I'm saying is in 1918, the Urban League in Detroit was one of its most active chapters. What was the Urban League? It was black people who had already successfully settled in New York, yeah. in, in Detroit, who were introducing ways of striving and succeeding to their black brethren coming from the South. Yes. This classic settlement house behavior. See, that, that's, that's, I would agree with that. But unfortunately, they never reached the bulk of the black group. The, the group as a whole 
did not ever really assimilate that ethos. In fact, it fell apart in the 60s and 70s. I mean, the great fact is that that kind of neighborhood you described no longer was normal for blacks in the North because of the upsurge of female-headed families, crime, school failure, drug addiction, all these problems simply exploded in the 60s. And you have, and that is, I think that's a lot of it is due to the fact that you have blacks moving from the South where the, the structure of authority is still external. And they come to the North and they haven't yet assimilated the new structure, which requires this individualist temperament, this inner moralism about good behavior. They hadn't yet taken that on board. So for a period of a couple of decades, there's chaos. See, that is what I think only a cultural analysis can explain. So I, what happened is very tragic, but it, it supports my view. The long-term story for Black America is assimilation. And now our problem is to get the group back on board and basically say, you got to get back on the train headed towards this kind of life. And, and that's what I think social policy has tried to do in the last 20 years is to restore a focus on good behavior so that Blacks, like other people, can proceed to pursue their own goals, their own, their own lives. And, and for I, I agree with you that those kinds of values should be promoted quite broadly. And uh, so when I see lottery advertisements and marijuana legalization designed to produce tax revenue, I agree. I, I see the state promoting vice yeah. and, and, and immediate gratification, which is the opposite of yeah. a life project. Yes. So again, I, I keep coming back to public policies that have deterred and, and, and derailed people from yep. what I think their inclinations were. In, in the case of black people coming out of the South, I believe they wanted to accumulate wealth. They wanted, I think there was an education culture that was, was, was nascent and flourishing. And I believe it was sidetracked yep. by progressivism. And you mentioned female headed families. I don't have to tell you, you're the expert, yep. you know, that, you, it, it may have made economic sense in referencing Charles Murray, of course, to, yeah. to become a single parent. The culture of education is very important. See, that grew up in the South. I mean, one of the most amazing things about Black America is that this group, although possessing nothing, founded their own universities and colleges on, on a wide scale, especially in the South, because they saw the need to take on board this particular feature of American culture, which was a focus on education. And that, and the, the veneration of education is still very strong in the black community today. But what's the reason why blacks do poorly in school is primarily that the families are falling apart. Right. So, so that the children don't have the support that they need to progress through the schools. And, and that is that, it's that fundamental order that has to be restored before you can resume this process of assimilation. Well, I, I agree with that. But I, again, point the finger at misguided public policies that, I mean, when, when Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote uh, his treatise on the, uh, what was then called the Negro family, yeah. you know, the, the black marriage, the black out of wedlock rate was 25%. I know. So something has changed there. Has the yes. residual collectivist culture somehow reared its head again? No, the, the, the catalyst, the change uh -huh. agent the new no. factor is the is the liberal welfare state. What happened? No, I'm not saying that the older culture restored itself. Rather, that um, you have a period of, of chaos where both the structures of a traditional society and the new individualism are absent. That's why there's chaos in this period, in the 60s and 70s. And now we have to get back to restoring the order that was growing up, as you say. Uh, in many uh, low-income areas, black areas of major cities. Uh, Philadelphia is another example where you had a, a, a strong local black culture that grew up in the 20s, 30s, 40s. Okay, well, that's, that's a thing of the past now. That, that low-income black, black society in Philadelphia is chaos. Mm -hmm. and, that's, that, and that's true also in New York and Chicago and Boston. These areas are struggling to restore the order that they had back then. And I agree with you that the permissive attitudes and elite policies are a major factor. I do entirely agree with that. But if and I'm putting more emphasis on that, and I'm dubious about this cultural hangover. But let's let's be constructive. You okay. know, if we are to restore uh, a sense of order and optimism, yeah, and a sense of 
life is a project in which I can succeed. Yeah. What are some promising ways that you see in which that's occurring, if any? Okay. Uh, what I say in the book, and I can elaborate a little bit more fully now, is that the most promising policies we have are programs that I would call paternalist or directive, where they basically, their clients are young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, mostly black and Hispanic. And the programs teach them about good behavior. And they basically say, these are the ways you have to function in order to get through this school and then to go on and pursue your own life. And this, this is cool. So you're pointing at school. Yeah, schools. But also there are some successful training programs for youth that have left school often without graduating. But these programs have a quasi almost like a military character. It's like a, sending a, a, a kid to boot camp where they get told how to, how, to, how to march, how to obey orders, how to get along with other people. Uh, all these things which a, a, someone coming from stronger families have already know. But they don't know that. So the programs are, in effect, reparenting the child. They're taking the child and, and instilling the attitudes that are necessary to maintain oneself while pursuing success in a free society. That is precisely what these top schools do. I'm thinking particularly of the leading charter schools. Right. right? All charter schools are successful. That's clearly not true. They're very diverse. Some are successful and not so successful. But the best of them have a highly structured character where the teachers are acting as the parents, which these students didn't really have, partly because they're coming from a, a single-parent family, and partly because the families think that life is about survival. They think the school has the whole burden of, of educating the child. Well, the, the, the school can't do that without support from the parents. The child has to see that the parents are themselves pursuing a coherent life aimed at certain objectives. And right, they, and I'm familiar with the KIPP schools and with success yeah. academies. Yeah. And I know that KIPP, which is a charter school network, actually uh, requires parents to sign uh, a, an agreement in which they say they will be involved. Yes. You know, so obviously they think it's not um, inevitable and something has to happen. They so, also, I know, uh, um, encourage kids to learn how to do some really basic things like make eye contact. Yeah, yes, yes. And, and speak up. Yeah. With confidence. You see, that, that, and those features are individuals. That is, ex those features are explicitly discouraged in some non Western cultures. It's thought to be disrespectful to look an authority figure in the eye, you know? Right. And, and that, 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 that may be true. And there's a terrific book uh, by a guy named Edward Hall called The Hidden Dimension mm -hmm. about such. Subtle things as how close to another person you should be if you're talking to them. Yes. You know, and that varies by culture. So, all of these very subtle interpersonal things absolutely vary, yes. vary by culture. But yes. I, I, I just, you know, I, I think we agree on so many things in terms of amelioratives. Yeah. But, but I, I, I just can't agree that, that this collectivist heritage, if it is that, explains the default uh, um, uh, behaviors in the, in the uh, groups that you're talking about. If you, without that, it's hard for me to explain why blacks and Hispanics, especially not just blacks, have a hard time seizing the opportunities that are available in American society. Our whole system assumes an individual's temperament. We take that for granted, but we cannot take it for granted. But these groups are not coming from that place. And, and there's, there, there are so many subtleties. So uh, are, are the non-legal immigrants less likely to be unemployed because they face more, more pressure? Peter Scarry has written about a great book called The Ambivalent Minority, as you know, about. And Milton Friedman talked about the, the, the welfare state and its complications for immigrants. So See, you know, I just keep going back to the public policy overhang rather than some residual, and, and that's, that's yeah. something we just have to disagree to disagree about. I think the, the, the more important contrast is between the immigrants of 100 years ago and what we see today, uh, and today's immigrants are coming into a world that is in some ways is more permissive than it was 100 years ago, but let's not exaggerate. The fact is the country has become more orderly than it was 20, 30 years ago right. because of 
conservative successes, such as cutting down crime, uh, enforcing the rule of law, reforming welfare so that you couldn't just live on it forever without doing anything. As you know, the current administration is going backwards on that. They have actually eliminated welfare for a big mistake in my view and the, and the view of other conservatives. So we have, in fact, restored order to a certain extent. And we're now working on the schools and there are some positive trends in the schools as well. So it, the, the difficulty isn't that society is runaway liberal as it was in the 60s and 70s. It's become more conservative. But the great problem is still to persuade the children of the heavily poor groups, blacks and Hispanics, and also Native Americans. We shouldn't forget about them. They are the most poor of all groups. All three of these, the great problem is they construe authority as something external to them. Life is still about reacting to the external pressures that you're under. It's not about pursuing your own goals. The, the problem for all these groups, which wasn't so true for the Europeans, is their difficulty in assimilating the structures that they need to internalize in order to avoid trouble. See, right. that and, and where I disagree with you about that is you're raising the Europeans. And I'm not convinced that Eastern Europeans or my peasant forebears, you know, uh, in, in the, uh, well, they weren't really peasants, but they were, you know, they were not wealthy people. They were in the shtetls of Eastern Europe. You know, or the, the Southern Italians are, are even more like the Mexicans in terms of having relatively low levels of education in their native language when they, when they emigrated. You know, to me, the change, the, the key difference is the, the willingness of established American society to welcome, but also ask them to bear the burdens of freedom as your book is entitled to say, learn the language, become a citizen, acquire skills, stay in school. I think we, I think that is what the difference is, not the character of the persons. See, the thing that other people don't notice, and for some reason I do notice, and the research notices, is the difference between active and passivity. See, the typical European is somebody who has an a focus on an external goal, and there's a quality of mobilization about their energies. They're going somewhere. Whereas when you meet people from a non-Western background, this includes Asians, Hispanics, Blacks, Native Americans, the, the fundamental stance is, is a passive one. You're waiting to get direction from your environment. You're reacting to the outside world rather than to your inner goals. That, that great difference between being a passive and active character. It, why does nobody else notice this? I, I can see this walking down the street. Well, I, th I think it's because people are reluctant, and I am, uh, to paint with such a broad brush rather than to acknowledge uh, yep. individualism within groups. And, and so by painting with such a broad brush, it makes people uncomfortable. And it I, might not be accurate, too. It, well, I'm agreeing that there's complexity. In fact, in the book, I emphasize that some parts of European America are abandoning individualism for a life of survival. We look at the less educated workers who have given up employment and, and whose lives are now no longer focused on a goal. Those people are engaging in survival, just like people from the Northwest. And meanwhile, we have many, as we all know, black Americans who become individualists, who are pursuing goals. I have friends and associates like this, as you do. And, and for them, it's no longer significant that they're racially distinct. It doesn't matter to me that they look differently because they don't act differently. The action is the thing that tells you, tells me that they're like me. They're pursued, they're like me. They're, they're overcommitted, uh, overachieving individuals. They have goals that they're trying to achieve and they may not achieve them, but th their life is organized around a certain mission. And, and is this that makes them compatible with America? And if you're not like that, if you're waiting for the world to change, if you're not taking initiative, which is unfortunately true for many of today's poor, then you're not part of the society. Well, I, think, I think another way, I would put the shoe on the other foot. America allows those with those proclivities to thrive. Not to say that they're compatible with America. No, they blossom because of America. But you've got to have a certain temperament. You've got to, be, you've got to have this inner driven. Yes, you're more likely to express that temperament when there's a culture around you that's, as you say, encouraging it. Yeah, it doesn't mean that your culture otherwise would hold you back. It's I Steve think, Jobs and his father. Well, what Steve Jobs did, he had a mission, and we often 
pursued it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but only because his father brought brought him to America, you know, or or had came to America and had Steve Jobs. Mm. So the, the the father may have had the same talents as Steve Jobs. It's not insane to think that. But in Syria you can't express them. It, there are in, so what I'm saying is there are people with individualistic tendencies probably all over the world and that they're drawn like a moth to a flame to America because they want that culture that we have where they can thrive. Okay. Now that that was a very important statement. That I think was really quite helpful, Howard. You're saying that the individual's temperament is actually universal, but it isn't can't express itself except in a society like the United States. Yes, I, I would I would say that. Right. And, and that the United States has changed in ways that is actually stifling it in, with some minority groups. All right. That is a coherent theory. I, unfortunately, I don't think the research supports it. This isn't what the scholars of world cultural differences talk about. There are like a dozen of them, and they basically say most people in, Amer in the world are interested in survival. They're not interested in freedom. Freedom is tough. Freedom loads various responsibilities on you that you don't have if you just adjust. Okay, the typical non-Westerner is, in fact, apparently absent from this individual. I, I, I just find it hard to believe that I, I, I know that my forebears came to America to survive literally. You know, my grandfather hid in a cellar from the Cossacks. Yeah. So he was not thinking, gee, I want to go and be free in America. He says, I want to survive. You know, I, so I think survival was always a motivation for immigrants. But then if, okay, it, certainly it was part of it. But most people, when they, a hundred years ago, when they came here, and certainly the world that we see in Tocqueville, for example, the 1850s, yes. you see a society in which people hit the ground running. They came here and they immediately started pursuing their own goals, especially they were trying to get rich, make money, get ahead, go west. You know, the, the activism, the dynamism, what you don't see in the immigrant communities today. You don't see that. We, we see a lot. We see significant rates, as I understand, of small business formation in the Hispanic community. Well, that's a little short of what I'm talking about in terms of having a goal that actually transforms your life and creates something new. I'm not saying that's nothing. That's something that, that certainly you're going to escape poverty if you do that. But that's not quite the same as what we saw in the period, in the earlier immigrant experience. I, I, I guess. I, I just think you're selling them short. I, I think it's a big leap to come to America for whatever your motivations. I don't think that the previous European ways were thinking at this more abstract level that you're, you're talking about. They knew they were going to not be oppressed. And that was... But, but they also... But the thing, this is where you, comparisons of other cultures are really important. Europe was individualist long before people came to America. Well, that's true. From the rest of the world. Western Europe was. Yeah. Yes. Now, Eastern Europe, not quite so clearly, but still very different from Asia, further east. No, Asia is very, very different. Asia never has this quality. Never. The, the European temperament, the activism, the inner driven quality is unique to Europe. It came only there, and it doesn't exist even today. Anywhere else except in the Western world and its offshoots, like the United States. And, and would you consider Singapore an offshoot? Hong no, Kong? No. Or the I've been to Singapore. When you go there, you see a very efficient, very productive, very attractive society. However, the individuals, to me, are not individualists. They basically think of themselves as groups, they think of themselves as participating in a, in a collective project. A very successful one. Now, Asia, that's the way Asia has made itself rich. They've made use of a collective culture to do this. They're not like us. And the fact is, that, is Israel a European offshoot? No. So, so, so uh, Singapore is not a European offshoot. Singapore is a thoroughly Asian country. Right. How about Israel? Israel thoroughly Western. Thoroughly Western. You know, so it's a European offshoot. Israel is Western because it's Jewish, and the Jews stand at the origin of Western culture. I mean, one of the great facts about the research is to show how important it was that the Jews settle on this idea very early, 
that right and wrong were matters of absolute principle, independent of the individual, independent of social pressure. And that's why you see in Asian, rather in, in Jewish tradition, these prophetic figures have come out and attacked the rulers for their moral shortcomings. They do. It doesn't happen in any other culture, ever, ever. Right. And, and if you transgress, your punishment is actually internal. Yes. Yes. Right? So it, yes. That, that's re a really subtle fact. Mm -hmm. right, in our time remaining, let's talk about foreign policy or America, mm -hmm. U.S. relationship with the wider world, given your, cons your, your yeah. construct, uh, your, your description of yeah. this cultural difference. I know, I know you're, you were um, a student of Sam Huntington's, right? Although Huntington didn't really ever write anything that carried cultural difference as a general theme in the way that I've done. Sam wrote a book about the cultural differences worldwide, and he specified something like seven different cultures, of which Europe is only one in Sam's analysis. Whereas in my understanding, the really dominant division is between the West and all the other cultures. Right, the West and the rest. Yeah. It, it, who who coined that phrase? Uh, the West and the Ferguson? No, no, that's um, Richard Nisbet. Yeah. I when I wrote this book, I relied heavily on Nisbet, and I wanted to know how his book uh, called "The Geography of Thought" had been received by scholars because I realized I was going to be breaking with a tremendous tradition here, and. He said that he, the book had drawn a lot of interest, but no serious criticism. And, and I came back to him and said, well, I'm, I'm making this basic contrast between the West and non-West. And he wrote me an email, which I carefully saved, in which he said, yes, it's pretty much the West against the rest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that certainly describes your book. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, let's say this. Okay. If it is so that there is this divide, between yeah. the West and the rest. One can argue, you know, George W. Bush, I don't know if he was the first to use the one, the word, the phrase nation building when he said he wasn't going to do it. And then, of course, he did. Yeah. And didn't succeed too well. You know, is, does that become part of our burden of freedom to spread individualist culture? And can you argue that we would one argue that that's what we've been trying to do? Uh, I think we have. I, that's exactly right. And I'm doubtful about whether it's practical precisely because the rest of the world does not have the moralism required to sustain and create and sustain a civic culture. That's why the rest of the world, with only one important exception, has, the rest of the non-Western world has not been able to generate strong institutions. And that exception is? Japan. Right. Yeah. Japan is the only non-Western country without an individualist culture that has shown a talent for strong government going back centuries. The Japanese have a political genius for Asia the way the British have a political genius for Europe. And in both cases, you have feats of political nation building that are inexplicable and which you can't account for why they do it and other Asian groups cannot do it. I mean, China... By the way, uh, after in, in the twenties, for instance, you know the Japanese drive on the same side of the road as the British. They admired the British tremendously. Yes. yes, one of my sources says Japan is so much like Britain; it should have been towed away and anchored off the Isle of Wight. <laughs> well, of course, they're both island merit and, and maritime nations. But it isn't the case that Japan is like England. Far from it. It is a completely collective society in which people struggle to, and they don't even attempt to differentiate themselves from other people. It's, it's, like, it's like Singapore. It's, it's like it's a single organism. And now, that organism is very formidable. And when mobilized by strong leadership, then the Japanese have done these prodigious things in history. I mean, the, the Japanese story is just astounding. It is it's astounding. Immense. But they're completely different from the West because they're, it's not based on individual development and striving. It's, it's not bottom up. It's really top down. Yeah, but we have auteurs in Japanese culture, great filmmakers. Those are acts of tremendous individual, yes. individual genius. There are exceptions, obviously, of people who are very creative coming from any country, any country. But those are not typical. 
And again, the research is important here. The research generalizes about groups and nations, about the characteristics that they have and don't have. And we need to take that seriously. You can always find success stories within any group that, that re rebuke the idea that anyone can't get ahead in America. I'm certainly not asserting that. There are success stories in every group, and that's great. But, it doesn't, but that doesn't follow that the group averages are the same, because they're not. Uh, they're Let's stick with the foreign policy theme in, yeah. in, in the little time we have left, because I, I want to know where you take that. If it's a fool's errand to think that we can introduce individualism and individual the idea of individual agency to cultures that are in which it's not rooted. Yeah. And when bad things start to happen in these places, is that an argument for isolationism? No, I think it's, I struggle with this actually in one of the last chapters of the book. Um, my first response is caution. Because the cultural basis for a democratic regime is not present in most of the world, we should not attempt to export democracy. It's not going to last because the society is unable to keep control of government because it doesn't have enough assertiveness to it. Asia, Asia in particular, the, the cultures are remarkably passive, remarkably willing to tolerate misrule. And a good example of that is uh, China, uh, both uh, historically and in the present. Yes. Now, I don't mean... Too, too soon to tell if that's true of India. India is a little bit more complicated because of the British heritage. The British ruled India for almost 200 years. And in that time, they implanted elements of a Western culture and Western institutions. So uh, India is basically the creation of the British regime. And it has certain British features. And there are also positive developments in India, as students have pointed out to me, against corruption. What you find, there are the movements in India that attempt to make an issue of corruption. See, corruption is the great problem in non-Western politics because the cultures are not moralistic. And therefore, it's hard to suppress self-dealing. because. You right. By the way, that was the, one of the key elements of Lee Kuan Yew's rule in Singapore is to expunge corruption. Yes. So he, whether that was just a utilitarian step on his part or whether he was moral because he was once Harry Lee, a British-trained uh, lawyer, I can't tell you. He was a hero, but he used what he did as something very unusual. He used top-down authority to stamp out corruption. Yes, and it, it could be done if you're consistent about it and sustain it over time. But unfortunately, the rest of the governing, and even in Singapore, I read stories that the regime is not so honest now. That basically the family and descendants of Lee Kuan Yew are running the place, and they're maybe not quite as squeaky clean as he was. I, I don't know, but India then becomes again getting sticking with foreign policy and the broader world, which is not even not really foreign policy. Understanding the broader world, it, it, if Huntington talked about a clash of civilizations, one could talk about an evolution of civilizations if India is evolving toward individualism. I think, they, I'm not saying there's no change. And I also say in the book that there's some signs of individualism in Chinese upper class culture. That in China, enough people have been exposed to the West, especially by having, being educated in the West or having their children educated in the West, that you find uh, a, a, a restlessness, a desire that there be more open political discussion and, and, and controversy even elections, at least that's what a lot of people would like to see in China. However, that is only a minority, and we're a long way from a cultural basis for a truly democratic culture. I don't see how Asia can do that, because they simply don't have the moralism. They don't have the prophetic voices that you find in the Old Testament. You don't find anything like that in China. The, uh, the, uh, the Chinese regime is, has an ethos that it claims, and an ethos of Confucius, in which they they talk about how the rulers should behave, but that's that's very much a philosophy. It isn't an operative moral commandment. In fact, all of Asian religion is very ambiguous about whether there are any strict rule, rules about anything. It's a structure of wisdom and 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 experience, but not really of rules. Uh, and it's only in the West, uh, and that's because of another feature of the West that we haven't talked about, and that is the West is given to theoretical thinking. We tend to believe in the truth of generalities and abstractions. And that isn't true in most of the world, and certainly not in Asia. And so that's why we can have Ten Commandments, 
uh, why they can burden us inwardly. And it's those inner burdens that allow us to be outwardly free. That is the basic temperament of the West. The West is willing to absorb inner burdens in order to be outwardly free. Well, and just 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 to take it full circle then and go back to African Americans and Hispanics. African Americans have been an exceptionally religious group. So they're certainly exposed to the Ten Commandments. Yep. yep. Right? Hispanics are en masse decamping from the Catholic Church to the Pentecostal Church. And that's positive. So far more individualistic. Yes, I agree with that. And I mentioned that. No, that is definitely a positive development. The black church, unfortunately, has lost authority over black private life, and it hasn't really been able to resist the collapse of the family that we find in poor black society. So the church has a great history, but its presence is not very great today. And 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 in the Catholic Church, you find essentially an abandonment of any idea of of, of structuring the lives of the Hispanics, because see that assumes that the population in the pews is has this temperament that internalizes and accepts inner obligation. But unfortunately, that is a Western feature. And only in the West do you find that. That's what generates in, uh, Western individualism is precisely the way and the and the structure of those internal those internal obligations. That's what generates the individualists of the West. If you don't have that, just just to, to sum up, I, I would say that a, our chief disagreement lies in my emphasis on public policy intervention, which I believe have suppressed the agency and aspiration of minority groups. Yeah. And, and, and you don't love those public policies either, but you attribute their status and situation to other factors. Uh, Howard, you made an important contribution to the discourse and that the idea that there's a kind of suppressed individualism that's universal and has been suppressed by adverse policy developments in the U.S. I, I can't say I support that, but it is consistent with the evidence in a certain way. And you and I think that's worth thinking about. And and maybe one could research it. Uh, and if it were true, it would make a big difference. So I appreciate that thought. Uh, we're going to have to close up shop now. But this is just what we hope to do in these discussions is to bring forth new ideas. And we have done that. So Howard, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for having me on, and uh, it's good to see you. It's good to see you, Jason.